Hello, Peppers. I am Chaz. And I am Dr. David Smith. And this is Pep. Not the Planet Extra podcast. Pep. And uh, right off the bat, let's get right into this. Yes. I am not going to talk about COVID much today because on the Friday show, which you can watch on our Facebook page or on YouTube, uh, that's uh, ABC Planet America on Facebook, um, I talked a lot about the new COVID numbers, which are fairly dire. In- incredibly dire. Yes. and But all I want to say on this podcast, which you thankfully reminded me, yes. is that we need to retract our our concession to Governor DeSantis. We made, a, we made a gracious concession, I think. We did, yes. A few weeks back, we said, okay. We were wrong about we you. We were wrong. We, 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 we were very sceptical about Florida, and you have proven yourself superior to us in every way. Florida, it went nowhere as far as COVID. You showed us how how to do it, but you but we were wrong. We, we're too, were we went too early. Wrong. Yes, and we went yes. wrong about Florida. We we're wrong about a concession because Florida is at five thousand cases a day and climbing. It is very dire. Yes. Just so on your show tonight, mm-hmm. I see that you are talking to the Green candidate. Yes. I, I wasn't even aware that a Green candidate had been nominated. Yes, does, Howie Hawkins. Does Howie Hawkins know about our long and dire history of denigrating third party candidates on this podcast? You know what? I don't think he knows much about our podcast oh, at all. Oh, well. <laughs> well, well, I hope you gave him a link. <laughs> I think that... Our podcast is possibly the only thing smaller than the Greens Party in, <laughs> in America. <laughs> so he's not aware of that. But, having said that, yes. Uh, having said that, he's a he's a very realistic guy, Howie Hawkins. I was yes. very impressed with his pragmatism. Yes. And so I suspect that he is probably on board about third parties going nowhere. In fact, I asked him about yes. third parties going nowhere, and he gave a very realistic response. So good on him. On him. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he's depressed about it. He yes. doesn't do things about it, but he's aware of the realistic situation he's that, in. That's good. I might watch that. Yeah. Um, speaking of this. <laughs> he clearly never watches our show. <laughs> yeah, go on. Speaking of the smallness of mm. our podcast, mm. though, interesting numerical comparison. Oh, yes. How many listeners going. do we have? How many regular listeners do we have? How many subscribers? The, la- the-, the last download that we got full results for because because yes. last week's is still it takes about two weeks to see what the final result is yes so two weeks back it was we just hit the seven thousand downloads number seven thousand why do you ask dr Dave? because how many people <laughs> did trump get to tulsa <laughs> six thousand two hundred we now, got you trump now admittedly <laughs> We don't have millions of people watching on Fox News, but it's just we, a matter of but time. With YouTube now, the <laughs> yeah, sky's the limit. That's right. I mean, because we're going to get algorithmically just shoved onto people. You no know, doubt. people are going to complain about no this. <laughs> <laughs> they already complain about us. They're going to be like, oh, oh, oh I, was, I was looking for videos about how My Little Pony should be more racist, but instead I got this <laughs> shit. <laughs> Which of us is going to run for president? You, obviously. No. <laughs> well, you got a lot more you've charisma than st- I do. You've got the stamina, though. That, that's D- what counts. Dr. Dave, that's not what counts. You've got the emoticons. Just look at that, the comments in our Facebook page. <laughs> that's what counts, the emoticons. You get the hearts. The hearts run for president. Let's talk race. Uh, over the last couple of uh, couple of days, well, that was a very smooth segue, Chaz. Uh, over the last Incredibly couple smooth. of days, there's been a lot of talk of police reform, which obviously we led. Once again, we're yeah. leading the way. We yeah. talked about police reform for weeks. Uh, it's just gone nowhere. Uh, we talked about about this on the show as well. But I just uh, wanted so, to... So just before you launch into that, so yes. are you beginning to sympathise now with the argument that the police are actually unreformable? Uh, well, well, so, so therefore we must defund... But no, no, no. I look, I, I think, I think the the original argument you made about yes. about uh, resources being misapplied to the police that we better applied elsewhere, mm-hmm. and not not abolish the police, right, but yes, reduce yeah. the funding and place. I, I thought that was a reasonable argument when you made it, mm. um, and I still do. Yes. And the and like I think that that is one of a suite of options. I don't think that and when I say suite, I mean I don't mean. 
I don't mean alternative options. I think there's a lot of things you need to do to the police. And that is one of those things. Obviously, you know, I'm not a big fan of qualified immunity, which I've discussed many times on this podcast. There's a few other things I think should be done, but that, but I do think that, uh, that some reduction of funding to, to, uh, like for instance, one of the things I talked about on the show today was about traffic stops and how large a part of people's interaction with the police it is and how it's completely unnecessary for the police to do that. Yes. Like you could just have your traffic cops who aren't cops, who are are just dudes in yellow vests who just run speed cameras and, and, and come and chase after you when you've, when you've run a a stoplight and Mm -hmm. give you a ticket. You don't need the police to do that. And that would, I think, first of all, it would, it would allow normal police to do do a proper job of policing rather than that kind of crap. Yes. And it would improve uh, relations with minorities significantly, mm. I would have thought, because that's where a lot of the bullshit yeah. happens. Uh, I remember back in 2014, mm. um, uh, sorry, I can't remember where I read it, but there was a very good piece about how one of the main causes of the deterioration between relations between the police and the African-American community in Ferguson, Missouri, which had been going on for years, was this really aggressive traffic policing Mm. by police, specifically targeting African-American motorists. Part of it was about raising revenue, as we've explained before, when there's always all of this competition over revenue, this becomes an important part of it. And, you know, as we've talked about before, what it eventually amounts to, you know, is is someone dead at the hands of the mm. police. But before you get to that point, you've always got hundreds of these kinds of just everyday incidents. Absolutely. And so yeah, so I think I think that is just one of many areas where the police don't need to be doing that job. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so to that extent, yes, I am sympathetic to the defund arguments. I will say that I, there, there was, and Matt Iglesias is quite fond of this particular argument, which makes me nervous because Matt Iglesias is often wrong. (laughs) Matt Iglesias is quite fond of making the point that until last year, Mm. the, the wonk solution for police was to actually have more police. Because the history, there's a, there's, a, there's been a lot of studies done which suggest mm. when you have lots of police on foot, yeah. just around, there's a lot less crime mm. and there's a, actually less interactions between the police and people on a well, criminal who the basis. Hell is still using the word wonk. Uh, Man- I thought Man- that, Man- that term got killed and buried <laughs> when it was applied to Paul Ryan. <laughs> I thought that was basically the end of the wonk as a concept. Well, F35 is still here after it was applied to Paul Ryan. So if if, if, if that can still be here, so can the concept of wonk. Um, is that that's so called F35, F45? The, the, the workouts he used to do, what are they called? F45? F45, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. F35 is the plane that doesn't work. <laughs> See, that, Which, sh- that shows that I'm a nerd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, I know and, more about- but the F35 yeah. is still with us despite yeah. actually being a bigger career failure than Paul Ryan. I actually saw a stat about this the other day. This is not a stat nugget. Watch out, Dr. Dave. So watch out, Hand of God. This is not a stat, stat nugget. <laughs> oh, We've we, we, got a sound ready we got to go. New, we got a new sound ready to go. But uh, <laughs> I can not tell you, I just saw a just random stat. Yes. That the F35 program. Now, yes. like 10 years after they started trying to fix it still has 873 software issues <laughs> <laughs> even today it's this trillion dollar program which is just so screwed anyway i don't think it's ever actually been used in combat or- no they're, they're selling it hasn't been used yeah, in combat yeah. but they're still selling I mean, it to you- suckers like us yeah, australia yeah. is buying some well, you can try and use it in combat but <laughs> you're luck. really rolling the dice there you better bring a, yeah, yeah, a software engineer with you when you don't do. don't try to fly it when it's raining Actually, or, just, or, or when you need to fly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. It's got a bit of a problem with taking off. Yeah. A yeah but bit, anyway. A little bit. But anyway, yeah. It's, what I was going to say was that the yeah. that if you get rid of police in a whole bunch of areas where they don't need to be, you can you can conceivably increase the foot patrol yes. while decreasing police numbers. And that there would be worth trying. So yeah, I'm I'm on board there. And there's definitely a there's definitely a problem that 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 needs to be solved. I saw an amazing stat. This is from this is a poll from uh, uh, Kaiser uh, from uh, last week. Seventy one percent of non Hispanic Black people polled said they've been subject to discrimination or violence because of their race by police. 
including 48% who said they'd feared for their lives. Yeah, that is not surprising at all. But wait, white people? Yes. 71% were black people? Yes. 23% white people. 48% of black people said they'd fear for their lives? 16% of white people. So... Yeah. I also don't find that very no, surprising. No, I'm not, I'm not saying, I, yeah, yeah. I didn't say it to shock you, but, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. but it just shows that there's a problem. And yes. in fact, even the police think there's a problem. This is a Pew <laughs> poll from 2017. 72% of police disagreed that cops in their department who consistently do a poor job are held accountable. <laughs> 52% of police believe it's not unusual for a police officers to turn a blind eye to improper conduct by other officers. And 61%, this goes back to something we were talking about before. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, sorry, 84%, even better, 84% say officers should be required to intervene when they believe another officer is about to use unnecessary force. Wow. 84% of police say that should happen. And there it, you go. And right now, it hasn't happened. And, and at the very least, the Democrats and Republicans could have got together on that one. Like that's such a simple, simple thing they could have passed, which they just didn't even bother. But anyway. I'm just trying to think of the number of things Democrats and Republicans <laughs> have got together on recently. It's it's just the stimulus. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Anyway. Um what's well, so so yeah, well, so we got nothing out of them. I'm I'm not gonna go through it because we went through it on the show, but the we did find out about Matt Gates having a pretend adopted son. So so that's so that's good at least. Even if we got no reform whatsoever. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that story. If you're interested no, in no, that let's, story. let's not go yeah, if into. If you're interested in that story, look up Matt Gates' adopted son. Get ready to spend hours <laughs> beating your head against your screen because <laughs> it's a frustrating one. Anyway, the most depressing thing about this whole thing, though, for mm. me, is that I saw a poll last week from YouGov that yes. said that in the that white people had gone in the, in the previous three or four weeks from mm. 48% to 50% of them being optimistic that the protests would lead to black people being treated better by police. Black people had gone from 52% to 62% optimistic. There was genuine optimism. Mm. And that optimism has been, at least so far, defeated again. Although we should remember states are actually doing the job. Yes. It's a more state thing than federal yeah. thing anyway. So there is that. I do want to talk uh, on this topic though. Every time I bring this up and it's depressing, I like to, I like to introduce a couple of ideas that they yeah. get thrown around that people don't necessarily yes. talk about. Women, women on the police force. That is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Oh, I don't know. It got pretty extensively ridiculed on Twitter this week. Did it? I didn't yes. even know that. Yeah. Oh, well, get ready to, to well, the, 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 t tell me. The, tell me if this is, if, if this well, is Well, someone did suggest, you know, women on the police force is a potential solution. Mm. And Twitter was just flooded with pictures of Lindy England pointing at well, Iraqi yeah. prisoners. You, you get some bad ones. <laughs> sure, but 27. And, I mean, the point being... Within a certain institutional framework, it does not matter who you are. Wow. 2017 Pew Poll. 11% uh, of female officers had reported they had ever fired a weapon while on duty, compared to 30% of male officers. Uh, controlling for differences in assignments, mm -hmm. uh, because obviously yep. the, the women might, might have been, they might, they might be more desk jobs or yes. whatever. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a study found that female officers were 27% less likely in male officers to exhibit extreme controlling behaviors such as threats, physical restraint, searches, and arrest in their interactions with citizens. Okay. There's some evidence. There yeah. you go. Take that, Twitter. Got them. We're, 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 let's add these up. We've got Trump. We've got Twitter. Yeah. We're just <laughs> how do these people even sleep at night <laughs> thinking about how hard we got them? I'll tell you another, another policy, though. I don't know if Twitter has ridiculed this this week. <laughs> Uh, the, and this was not noted by one person, Cory Booker, because it's his policy. Um, <laughs> Cory Booker's baby bonds. Do you remember during the election, during the primary campaign, his, his baby bonds idea? No. Uh, his idea was this. This wasn't about the police. This was about, this was about race issues, full stop. Right. right? And in particular about the wealth gap. Yeah. Between, um, between black families and white families where you go, your, your net worth is like 170 grand for your typical white family. And it's yes. like 17 grand for your typical black family. Yes. Uh, his idea was this, you give everyone, not just black people, everyone a savings account of a thousand dollars when they're born. 
then depending on their income, mm -hmm. they might get anything from zero. So their family income, obviously yes, one-year-olds yeah, yeah, yeah. aren't making a lot of money. But they're, they're, depending on their family income, they get every, anything from zero to $2,000 per year every single year until they're 18 with the interest that accrues during that period as well. Which will be nothing because interest rates aren't going to go up for another 25 years. <laughs> oh, sure. But, but so they're but, going, adding but, a thousand to it every but, year. But, but, yeah, you're talking 37 grand even with zero interest mm -hmm. for low-income families, yep. okay, for low-income people. And, yeah, he, he posited that would end up in the 40s, maybe even 50 grand, but, yeah, you make a good point. Anyway, and when you get to 18... You can then access it, but you're only allowed to access it for the purposes of education, home ownership, or retirement, as in to, to, to put right. directly into a, into a retirement account, your social security or something like yeah. that. Um, and, and the, the, he had to pay for about, you know, estate taxes and stuff like that. It's just, it's pretty reasonable stuff mm. about, you know, restoring 2009 year estate tax rules, closing loopholes for inheritance taxes, that kind of stuff. Um, and I, and at the time I always thought that was a pretty good policy, a pretty reasonable policy. Cause it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's yeah, yeah. pretty realistic, but it actually make a big difference to the poor. And when you're talking about the poor, they are largely black people in this case, the people we're talking about here, which is what, which is why he sold it as a race yes, yeah, reconciliation yeah, yeah. policy. Uh, I think that would make such a big difference and it doesn't actually cost that much to do. Mm. And the, and it would, and yeah, and like Social Security has a universal component to it, so yes. people would get into it, but obviously you wouldn't be paying rich people very much. They'd get yeah, $1,000 yeah, yeah. and that's it. Um, yeah, I reckon that's one that's one worth considering again. What do you think? Oh, I'm not sure about those restrictions mm -hmm. uh, on what you can use it for. You're not worried that an 18-year-old, you give them 40 grand and they'll just buy a car? Well, that's... I mean, a car can be very important for employment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm. it, 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 in the United States, in mm. most places, you need a car mm. to exist, basically. Mm. You certainly need a car to work. So mm. I wouldn't be particularly worried about that. Mm. This is the, the problem is whenever these kinds of restrictions are put on with the aim of making the poor more virtuous. Mm. Uh, it often shows a lack of understanding about what the reality of poor life is. And I'm not saying that Cory Booker doesn't mm. understand poor life. Cory Booker was mayor of Newark and made a point mm. in living in housing projects and things like that. But he's got to sell it to a wide audience, mm. uh, which I think is why you have those sort of restrictions. But as a general idea of the species of actually giving people money works, which was something that was shown in a report this week, about basically, you know, what, what has been the effect of all of these cash transfers mm. um, from Congress? The poverty rate's gone down. Exactly. It's as yeah. if the poverty rate yeah. has gone down. Yeah. And people are looking at this like they've just invented fire. <laughs> um, so, yeah, as, as part of this sort of general program of giving people money, yes, I think it's a, it's a good idea. I think the, the way that... Booker had to frame it, you know, is in a very sort of classically Cory Booker way mm. of how will this appeal to the rich people who are ultimately funding this. But mm. um, as a, as a you know, general idea, giving people more money, yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, one thing that is happening yes. is we're actually getting some action for police misconduct. Right, for yes. A for a nice change. Yes. Uh, like we got uh, finally... Three months later, the the police who busted in Keystone cop style and shot everything in sight in Brianna Taylor's apartment. Yes. Uh, one of them's gotten sacked at least and they're still investigating. I don't know how long you have to investigate that for. But anyway, at least one of them's got sacked. This guy called Hankerson. Uh, they, they released, uh, well, they didn't release it intentionally. It was kind of leaked out the termination letter from the police chief. From, oh, really? From Louisville, which is quite... What did it well, say? I was, I was going to say it's quite funny. Obviously, this topic isn't funny, but just yeah. you'll see what I mean. There's a, there's a dark comedy about it. <laughs> I have determined you violated standard operating procedure when your actions displayed an extreme indifference to the value of human life when you wantonly and blindly fired 10 rounds into the apartment of Breonna Taylor. You further failed to be cognizant of the direction in which your firearm was discharged. <laughs> Some of the rounds you fired actually travelled into the apartment next to Miss Taylor's, endangering <laughs> the three lives in that apartment. Three months later, that guy has been sacked. That guy has been around for three months. The guy who didn't know which direction he was firing in and fired into the wrong apartment. That guy took three months to sack him. But that's 
that's a sacking that wouldn't have happened before yeah. these last few weeks. Let's that's face true. it. Yes. Um, that guy also, by the way, that Hankinson guy was also disciplined last year for reckless conduct that injured an innocent person, but we haven't found out what exactly that was about. The other two officers, the other two Keystone cops, they've still got their jobs. But uh, anyway, it's a step. It it's a, a step. step. It's a step. Another step is the three Arbery killers have been indicted on murder yes. charges. Now, right. you might go, three? I thought there were two. And then there was a guy who filmed them. Yeah, he's been indicted on murder as well. Right, okay. Now, that's an interesting one because, yeah, Brian, this, this guy, was he was charged. I bet he wishes that he hadn't taped that. <laughs> that thing now. I bet Mick Michael wishes he didn't send it to the press. Oh, man, what a self own. Anyway, um, that that Brian guy, the videotaper guy, he was charged with felony murder mm -hmm. and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. Now, you might be wondering how the hell is this guy guilty of murder? He didn't even seem to have a gun. He was just in a car filming them. Uh, well, remember, felony murder is a special kind of charge. Felony murder means that you committed a felony on your way to someone being dead. Yeah. And the felony presumably is the false imprisonment one. That is because he blocked Arbery's exit. Right. Yes. And, yep. and then Arbery died. Yep. So I don't know if they're going to, if that's going to, they're going to pull that one off or not, but that's the, that's the idea behind that charge. Yep. So it's not, it's not a wild charge. There is, there, there, there is logic behind it. Um, the, there is one prosecution that is worrying me a little bit, which is the Brooks prosecution. This is the one in Atlanta. Right. The yeah. guy, the guy who fired the taser. It was empty at the time he fired it. And then he got a load of lead for his troubles in the back yeah. uh, from uh, that Rolf guy. Mm -hmm. This is the thing. This is the thing that makes me a little bit worried about this prosecution. Uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the guys who just charged Arbery and yep. the, the, the Arbery's killers, um, they said, quote, we're in the process of conducting this investigation. This is, uh, this is after he'd announced the charges, the DA. Although we have made significant progress in the case, we have not completed our work. The GBI was not aware of today's press conference before it was conducted. We were not consulted on the charges filed by the district attorney. Despite today's occurrence, the GBI will complete its mission of completing an impartial and thorough investigation of this incident. We will submit the file once completed to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Okay, so, and that, by the way, that guy, that DA, they're also investigating him for ethics lapses. And he's in the middle of a primary. So it's starting to, starting to stink a little bit. Yeah. These charges. That, mm. And if, if, they, if they don't come up with exactly the same charges he did, yeah. They can be used in, as part of the defense. Yeah. Which that would be a complete disaster. It really would. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's, that's worrying me. Yeah. That's worrying me a lot. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, let's, uh, okay. Okay. Just, just little bits and pieces about protest and race before we move on. There's, we should, we should note that the, that Chaz slash chop has been disbanded. Yes. Yes, yeah, been disbanded. They 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 put a little uh a little um this was the the autonomous zone in mean, Seattle. In Seattle, that's right. They put out a little statement saying uh amongst other things, we call on everyone to continue the struggle through Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and Snapchat. Now, I, that was the note I made from their cuz from their little announcement yeah, yeah. cuz I found it funny. So I thought okay, I'll make it a, is, uh, it is yeah, pretty funny. I'll yeah. make a note of that and I'll, and I'll I'll piss all over them on the podcast I thought as I took that quote. But then today I went back to make my notes and I thought let's see what else they said. I'll go back and yes. find a few more quotes. So I went back to the to Twitter mm -hmm. to find their their announcement. I couldn't their, their account has been just suspended. Oh, no. <laughs> Two days after they called on everyone to continue the struggle through Twitter, the, Facebook, the Instagram, and Snapchat. The twaz has been suspended. <laughs> yes. Yes, it has. So, so that struggle ended pretty quickly. Okay. But let's talk about now what you really want to talk about, Dr. Yes. Dave, which is the most important thing about protests. So we, we so actually, before we talk about Shake Shack, I oh, just yeah? do want to make yeah. a, a very brief but important point okay. about do protests. That. Do that. Yeah. Which Anything is, about protests before we get to Shake Shack. Poll evidence is overwhelmingly showing that these protests have actually changed minds. Yes. Including white minds. Mm. And they've changed them about the systemic nature of racism in the United States. Yes. Now, I agree with the pessimistic view that it is going to be a while before we see meaningful change out of this, mm. especially with either Trump or Biden as the next president. 
but that shift in discourse is that is not something to be taken lightly. And the fact that the the country is getting better at understanding the concept of structural racism, that is also not to be taken lightly. So uh, I think that um, it it really is, and, and I think this was one of the things that really defied expectations. I mean, I expected a much bigger backlash yeah. than what I expected. Something like what happened in 2014 uh, or 2016, that just never really eventuated. I didn't expect to see polls where 58% of Americans were agreeing that it was justified to burn down a police station. Did not expect to see polls where 58% of people agreed with the idea that Trump is a racist. Mm. So that has been really significant. And I think it's the power of protest as well as the the sort of unique power of the event that uh, that triggered it that's really, um, really important. But now let's get to something yes. far less important, which oh. is, so we talked last week. <laughs> yes. We talked last week about yeah. the three New York police yes. officers who the P- Patrolman's Benevolent Association and there was some other fucking union that also <laughs> put out a statement. So three of our brothers uh, are in hospital with Dr. diarrhea. Bear, I have the quote. You have the quote? Hashtag breaking yes. when NYC police officers cannot even take meal without coming under attack. It is clear that environment in which we work has deteriorated to a critical level. We cannot afford to let our guard down for even a moment. Not even a moment. <laughs> okay, so... Yes. Now, we were talking last week about what really happened and Mm. uh, it had been posited that maybe some bleach from cleaning a machine accidentally ended up in the shakes and I poo-pooed that idea, but no. Okay, that actually turned out to be correct. (laughs) Uh, Who would have thought? They cleaned their machines. It was a cleaning agent. So I profoundly (laughs) apologised to the New York Police Department for doubting the bleach the cleaning agent story, but... That's not the point anymore. No, it's not. It is not. The, that it's is not. absolutely not the point anymore because what actually happened was the officers got their drinks, sort of smelt, tasted, and said, oh, this isn't right. Yeah. Aler- alerted the manager. The manager quickly figured out yes. what had happened, chucked them in the bin, gave them new drinks. Yes. Then they went back to the police and station. And vouchers, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> went back to the police station, told their commanding officer yeah. about this. And that is when the shitstorm began. Then it was hashtag breaking. They were actually for- <laughs> forced to go to hospital despite not feeling sick at all or having yeah. any symptoms. Now, can you imagine, right, you're a New York police officer. You know, you're the thin blue line. Not so thin, they're at Shake Shack. <laughs> yes. But you're what stands between... Ordinary, yeah. decent New Yorkers yep. and roving bands <laughs> of anarchists, looters and wise guys, Yes, in the words of President Donald Trump. <laughs> in a situation like that, you can't project weakness. No. Right? You, you, you cannot project illness. And yet. In order to make a political point, your own commanding officer sends you to hospital and then your own union tells the world that you got diarrhoea when Sadly you didn't. Sadly let down. Sadly let down. Oh, my God. By the way, by the way I, don't want to, I don't want to downplay the diarrhoea point. Yeah. We should back over that. They didn't even get diarrhoea. No, they didn't. Okay. But, but we should just note as well that the order for the drinks... <laughs> Was placed by phone. Yes. It was placed by phone. And when the cops turned up, it was in a package. Yeah. So it would have been literally impossible for them to be targeted. There, there was another ridiculous <laughs> incident in Los Angeles. Ah, this is where we're going, Dr. Dave. This week. This, oh, this is where okay. we're going. You, you know about this. I do. I do. I, I, I promised Dr. Dave a treat. And, and oh, I was talking about this, this I, is the tree. I think I already slurped that tree for that <laughs> tree up. Well, why don't you start talking about it? Then? Yes, so there was another incident. <laughs> yes. Where a Los Angeles cop yeah. said that there was a tampon. In his Starbucks in frappuccino. In his Starbucks frappuccino. <laughs> yes. 
And he was off duty, so not uniformed, but he said he play he paid mm. with his police credit union card. But realize that when he says yes. he paid with his police union credit card, yeah. they in America they don't handle your cards. No, God, because no. of the pandemic. They don't even handle them here. Yeah, well so so they would have to be scrutinizing <laughs> The nuance of his card the, as he just... The just, cashier was apparently behind glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. He what, just flicks it past. What would have been required for this to happen? Like, if, if yeah. you're not a fan of, you know, magic bullet theory of JFK's death, <laughs> you are not going to like the yeah. elaborate construction of, yeah. of what supposedly happened here. Yeah. Where the cashier would have had to alert the barista who's making it. <laughs> and the barista undetected by the whole store, would have had to pr- produce a tampon from that somewhere. That they were just carrying somewhere? Well, there was also <laughs> an sleeve, insinuation just on the it was chance. a used tampon. Yeah. yeah and, <laughs> you know, spike the cop's coffee with it. Yeah. But but it gets even better. Oh, it does. It does. I, I've only just I think begun. You, you take it from here. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Okay, well, first of all, first of all, yeah. I, I don't want to leave behind the fact that the cop, according to the cop, he discovered the tampon while he was halfway through finishing the frappuccino. <laughs> so what does that say about Starbucks frappuccinos? You could be halfway through before you notice there's a tampon in there. Yeah. There are out. no heroes in this <laughs> story. Right. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, okay. So, 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 so where we're going from here is yes. you need, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in. See, Dr. Dave gives you real homework. You know, he gives you like these, these thick books to read. I'm going to give you tampons to look at. I'm going to give you an article to look at. Have a look at this photo. You've seen the photo, I assume. Yes, I have. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a massive object. <laughs> I'm not going to call it a tampon. I, I Look, I'm a man. I'm not a woman. But I don't believe that women are that big down there. <laughs> that object. The object is very, okay, very big. Let's get off this uh, the, this particular point. There isn't even a string attached. Yes, no, there is and not I a string. And I know enough about tampons to know that there should be a string. Yep. Well, you, you say you should get off that. You say you say we should get off that, but Vice performed an experiment because because <laughs> Vice saw that as well, and they thought the same thing. They thought they thought that is yeah, not yeah. a tampon, so they went and got a tampon, and they and, and that complete with plan diagrams and like that. It's it's it, 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 it's a physicist must have designed must have put together this experiment, and they 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 tried it out. They tried out the tampon and the frappuccino and to try and work it, and they, and they've concluded there's just no way that this is real. No, but. But uh, the, the, the same thing happened, like New York. The, the Los Angeles police came out with their statement, as per usual. This disgusting assault on a police officer disgusting was carried out by assault. someone with hatred in their heart and who lacks human hatred decency. in their heart and who lacks human decency. <laughs> we hope they are publicly exposed, fired, arrested, and prosecuted for their prosecuted. cowardly and repugnant actions. Oh, no. But wait, wait, wait. And yes, this continues on. And yes, yes. I'm aware of the Shake Shack hoax. (laughs) That's why I spent all evening working multiple independent sources. Oh my God. And this didn't come from the union. Working multiple independent sources, Dr. Dave. Multiple independent sources. This guy leads quite the party lifestyle. That is amazing. Where this is all going is you'll be shocked to hear that Target, which is where this Starbucks was, had a look at their video footage and did not find any oh, suspicious behavior. Oh, what a surprise. So there you go. <laughs> so, there was another... Uh, oh. what, what is it about the police, Dr. Dave? What is it about the police? They assume everything is about their job. Well, yeah, there was an article which I'm trying to find, They're but I can't, about the, yeah, about the history if, of police making false claims. If, if I found a tampon in my Frappuccino, I would not presume it was because they don't like pep. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the police just assume it's, they're in their plain clothes. They just assume it's about their job. Uh, it's such a victim mentality. It really, really is. Look, I wish I could find this article mm. about the history of false police reporting about food <laughs> hoaxes. But it, it, um, cause it is, it's, it's more prevalent than, yeah. than you would like. Um, but I remember one line from this story was about a police officer who found a bite taken out of his McDonald's burger. Oh, despicable. actually went... To, uh, here we are. It's from Rolling Stone. Okay. In this vein, police officers specifically have a history of alleging food tampering. Last summer, an Indianapolis police officer accused a McDonald's employee of tampering with his food by biting into his sandwich. 
only to later realise after placing an anonymous phone call to a radio station (laughs) that he was the one who took a bite. How could you not realise that? Later that year, (laughs) a Kansas police officer claimed that a McDonald's employee wrote the words fucking pig on his beverage cup only for it to be later revealed that he had written it himself. He forgot that as well. (laughs) They've got real bad memories, these guys. Dr. Dave, oh. I couldn't treat you with the with the tampon frappuccino because you already knew that story, but I've got... You've got something an else. An even bigger treat. Okay. It's a new sound card. Stats Nugget. Oh, wow. The siren. Yes. Stats Nugget On their time. way to take down McDonald's. <laughs> Very quick Stats Nugget for you. Yeah, what's that? The, the, this will not surprise you, but it's... Good to know. Just yes. before we move off this uh, this topic, from 1992 to 2018, Dr. Dave, mm-hmm. how much have violent crime arrests, arrest rates dropped amongst 18 to 24s? What percentage? Oh, I would have to think pretty substantially given that the crime rate has dropped very substantially. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say 75%. Not bad, 60%. Okay. 68% for 15 to 17s. That was a... <laughs> <laughs> Stats nugget. Quick and the dead, hand of God. <laughs> okay. So did you have to record that? Uh, hey, excellent. Yeah, he, he, I'm not sure you could hear what you just said. He said one of his mates did. Yeah. yeah so. Dave, yes. talk to us about Tom Cotton. Okay, well, so Tom Cotton's weekly piece of idiocy... <laughs> It is weekly these days. (laughs) Yeah, today was, you know, there's been a lot of talk about DC statehood, um, which, you know, happens from time to time. I believe, I I remember a few years ago in DC, there were actually license plates which had the the slogan of the district as uh, no taxation without representation. You know, this has been a sore point for a very long time. Understandably. And it became another sore point, obviously, because, you know, when Trump is the one who has the authority to send in the National Guard or Mm. other parts of the US military, that doesn't really Mm. sit well. Um, So anyway... Tom Cotton's complaining in Congress about this idea of DC statehood in very, very thinly veiled racial terms. What's his concern? Okay. So he starts off with these slurs about, oh, do you want me, Muriel Bowser or Marion Barry? Marion Barry, for those of you who don't know, is... He was a, a very corrupt and drug-addled DC mayor, mm. uh, but he's just become this sort of byword in conservative circles. But this is what happens when you let African Americans into high office. I, I'd say the answer to his question, by the way, is if people want them, they will vote for them. Yeah. <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah, so someone pointed out on Twitter in net terms, Marion Barry currently stands as a much better job creator than Donald Trump. Also, Jane Coaston, uh, who's one of my favourite writers on Vox, actually a former student of mine at University of Michigan, though I can't claim credit for ever having taught her anything. Um, (laughs) She was an absolutely brilliant student. Um, Yeah, she pointed out that Marion Barry, one of his first sort of ventures into politics was in 1973, starting up some sort of ridiculous vigilante group to protest the movie Superfly. (laughs) I did not know about that. Anyway, um, so Tom Cotton's ranting on about uh, Marion Barry, who is increasingly a figure of no significance except to white conservatives as this supposed cautionary tale about what happens in black majority cities. Makes sense. Tom Cotton is nothing but Superfly. Yeah, but then he starts (laughs) on, because, you know, obviously it's pointed out, well, Wyoming, with population substantially smaller than D.C., 400,000 people, why do they get to be a state? And Tom Cotton says, well, because that's, They've got three times as many people involved in logging and uh, mining and (laughs) ten times as many people involved in manufacturing. So he said, in his words, it's a well-rounded working class state. Now, you know, you you do not need to be some sort of racial savant to understand <laughs> uh, exactly yeah. what he's uh, what he's talking about there. But this does give me an opportunity to make a much bigger point about statehood. 
which is people don't think very often about, you know, why do some places actually get to these states while others don't? I mean, we know the, the story of the original 13 colonies mm. and why they're all states. Um, m- most Americans would be aware of, you know, Texas's weird history, how it was yeah. part of Mexico, that Mexico brought all of these uh, white Americans in who then formed their own separate republic that mm. eventually... Uh, got admitted. By the way, Dr. Dave's trivia question for this week. What yes. is the one other state that formerly had an existence as an independent republic? Oh. Hawaii? No, it's actually Vermont. Wow. Vermont split off from Canada and had to wait a couple of years before it could be admitted into the Union. So it was a it was a short-lived uh, republic. Mm. Um, but, okay, a lot of the ways that, pe- that places became states were pretty haphazard, mm. right? So West Virginia becomes a state because it's the it was the anti-slavery part of Virginia, right? So yep. split off. Um, you know, Kansas and Missouri, uh, the there's a, a compromise there over uh, over slavery, but but th- so those are both related to this massive massive conflict over slavery, which I'm going to talk more about later on. I don't know where you're going here, but I'm assuming. If well, you're, if you're talking about dodginess, North Dakota and South Dakota. Well, and yes, <laughs> this is what I'm beginning to get to. <laughs> yeah. After the Civil yeah. War, right, yeah. we've got to remember, Republicans basically dominate Congress for about 50 years mm. after the Civil War, yeah. all the way through to about 1896. One of the ways that they do that is both during and after the Civil War, they are constantly adding new states okay. in order to get new pairs of reliably Republican senators. Because <laughs> a lot of these Western states, for various reasons, they knew that they could rely on them to be Republican. And Democrats just, just took it? Well, Democrats didn't have the power to stop them because they were a minority. Yeah, yeah. Especially like during the Civil War. Yeah. You know, it's a bit of a shortage of Democrats in Congress yeah, sure. during that period. Immediately afterwards... There's also uh, a, a significant shortage during Reconstruction. I mean, mm. they gradually, but this is the thing, then Democratic numbers gradually begin to rise again and so Republicans keep adding new states in order to keep <laughs> oh, maintaining <okay. laughs> their advantage <laughs> yeah. uh, in in the Senate. Um, so a whole a bunch of states get So Nevada got admitted, I think, during the Civil War. All Nevada had was uh, was something like... Oh, it was a population that was in the tens of thousands, mm. um, revolved around uh, silver mining, which was very much associated with Republicans because of Republicans' stance on currency. Um, yeah, they get to be a state. I remember reading somewhere there were these sort of unofficial population thresholds uh, that it was generally regarded a state should get to this number before it gets admitted as a state. But during that 50-year period, those were just thrown out the window. Like, if you'd waited for Nevada to get to that level, you would have been waiting until 1972 to make Nevada a state. But, yeah, so all of these states, you alluded to North Dakota Mm. and South Dakota who came in in the uh, Omnibus Statehood Act of 1889. Very corrupt uh, (laughs) little bit of legislation there to, um, to maintain Republican power. But, anyway, the point being... There is no rational, justifiable reason why Wyoming and Montana should be states, while DC and more importantly Puerto Rico, oh God, yes, are not states. Yeah, there is absolutely no reason why. I mean, it's it, it's something we do have a tendency to imagine geographical borders and geographical entities as kind of natural. Mm. But have, have you seen the borders of states like Colorado? Yeah. Straight lines. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, you know, th- th- these were created mm. in order to fuck with the Senate. Yes. <laughs> in a way that benefited Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. There is. And so, yes, if you create DC as a state, probably Puerto Rico as a state, yes, they're going to be Democratic rotten boroughs. Mm. But this is historically the way that states get to be part of America. Yeah. I, it's. I'm kind of torn on this because, you know, I am a sap. And so, so I do, I do, my instinct is when I, when, when I, when I hear this, I go, and I know that, yeah, a lot of the people pushing this are pushing it for political reasons. Yes, They're yeah, Democrats yeah. Who, who can see four senators and go, oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah. But 
It's just a fact that oh. Washington DC and Puerto Rico really should be states. They should. And if there was some compromise where you could scratch the Republican backs in some way, I got no idea how <laughs> to allow it to happen. I'd be happy to do that because I, they should well, be states. I think I mentioned on the show before that the Upper Peninsula of Michigan wants to be a state <laughs> there you go. called Superior. <laughs> yeah. It's got about five hundred thousand people. Yeah. Well, I just yeah, it's just it's just it is Main especially Puerto are Rico logging is, and meth. Well, yeah. logging. Tom Cotton, he'll love that. Yeah, yeah. It's very well rounded. Well, Logging the, the and meth, meth rounds it out pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it is, especially Puerto Rico, is just shocking that that's still not a state. And actually, I'm surprised that Washington, D.C. wasn't made a state in that Republican orgy because in the, in the <laughs> late 19th century, because they would have had enough people then, wouldn't they? And they would have been Republican. Mm, wouldn't have been Republican. This is no. I mean, Washington DC. You've got to remember, historically, it's a southern city. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. It was pro-slavery. The city itself was pro-slavery. I did not know that. Slavery was in the city. You learn something every podcast. Um. So no, I'm I'm not surprised. Okay. That, uh, mm. Yeah, that it didn't get in in as you said that Republican orgy of, <laughs> uh, of state admission. Yeah. Let's move on to 2020. Yes. Uh, and there were some results just this week. Elliot Engel got primary. He got primary. He got primary. Now, people have been trying to paint this as the same as AOC with um, Joe Crowley, but it, it really wasn't because there, there, there are a few sort of essential mm. differences. Number one, policy-wise, he actually wasn't that different to the guy he was against, Matt no. Bowman, except on foreign policy. Foreign yes. policy is very different, but that wasn't a key aspect in the primary. Like Bowman did make a little bit, of the differences in foreign policy, but the it was I mean, like, and and I just just detail them briefly for those who care. Uh, Elliot Engel was pro Iraq war, anti Iran deal. He was pro MBS from Saudi Arabia Ugh. after the Khashoggi killing. Yeah, yeah, which was a bit strange. He was one of the very few Democrats to vote against banning the sale of cluster bombs to Saudi Arabia. Yes, mm, beginning this, to see some patterns here. Yeah, that was that was after the Yemen war started. By the way, he was still in, into cluster bombs. Um, he supported moving the embassy to Jerusalem. He says the United States should veto any and all UN resolutions against yeah. Israel. That probably wasn't very popular amongst Democrats. No. But, the, but the fact is, he's a real old guy who's yes. been around for 30 years. He wasn't even in his living in the city during COVID. No. Uh, he's, he's just lost all connection to his electorate. This Bowman guy is charismatic. Yes. He's, he's a black guy in a in a majority minority district. Yes. And he's not a drone no. <laughs> with no charisma, which is what Elliot Engel is. Yes. Although he did have the endorsements of Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, yes. Well, it's interesting in that because yeah, people go, oh, the establishment. Because you got you got Chuck Schumer, Hillary Clinton, Pelosi, yeah. Andrew Cuomo endorsed yeah, yeah. him. You go, well, these are all killer endorsements, <laughs> Engel. But yeah, I would say that as far as establishment goes, on the other side, mm. Bowman had... AOC, Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and the New York Times. Right, yes. The New York Times is certainly not anti-establishment. No. Um, and also, I do feel like insurgents become establishment very fast. Oh, they do, yeah. Like, I feel like, I feel like even AOC now is part of the, is part of the scenery. Like, she's still, yeah. still, still semi-insurgent. Well, we've, we've but, talked before. She mm. has proven to be a very canny legislator. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and that, I'm not I'm not knocking her about that. I'm no, just saying, no, no. I'm I saying think she's yeah. she's way it's good. She yeah, yeah. I, I think she hasn't given up very much, yeah. and she has become way more effective than she ever would be if she was just some outsider insurgent. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that there, there yeah. is there is a new a new establishment yes. being formed uh, even as we speak. But have you? I mean, it's so it's remarkable now those the, the four. Congressmen from that single area of the Bronx and Westchester mm. have gone yep. since 2018. Yep. That it, that whole part of These, the New York. And, and they're all safe seats. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of yeah. The New York delegation has, uh, has gone. Yeah. And so it was, uh, yeah, and, and the new delegation is a lot younger and a lot more African-American. Yeah. yeah, 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 which it should be. Yeah. That's representative. Um, do you have... I'm going to move into a slightly new, different area of this Ooh. of these results. Do you have anything else to say about Engel and the results of Tuesday before no, we move on? Let's no, that's okay. All right. Forget Engel. What, what I was going to move on to was I was looking up the results and I saw 
with 92% of precincts reporting, Bowman had 60.9% of the vote and Engel just 35.6%. And I just suddenly thought, there's something we need to tell you guys because this What's is, because this is no, definitely not that. This is creeping up on us and it's about to become a really big deal. And people aren't talking about it much. With 92% of precincts reporting, Bowman had da 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 da. Do you know what that means? With 92% of precincts reporting, because we hear this all the time. What does that mean? What it means is there was one vote reported from that precinct at least. Right. The reason why that, now normally that's not a big deal because yeah, yeah. you go, okay, well, they, they just gave you 50% of the votes and they're about to give you 70% of the votes. The election we're about to have is not going to be like that. No. The won't. election that we're about to have, when they say with yeah. 92%, of precincts reporting, that might mean only 10% of the vote has been counted because yes. most of it is going to be mail-in voting. Absolutely. And the mail-in voting is going to be late. Yes. So on election day, when you see 36% on, yeah, yeah. on like a CNN graphic there saying 36% has been counted, that's yes. not votes. That is precincts have begun to respond. Yes. And that will be massively misleading. And Donald Trump for sure is going to go Absolutely, yes. it's going to go oh look 85% of precincts are reporting therefore i win that state yes. even though in reality there is about to be many 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 more votes to come to come in yes. through absentee and mail in voting absolutely so i've got yeah. an article coming out in the conversation mm. on monday about mm. this well one of the things that it looks at is mm. this very issue which is donald trump does appear to be preparing to dispute the election mm. Um, I mean, he took a very fatalistic turn this afternoon saying Joe Biden might become the president because not enough people love me. But uh, <laughs> that, that, that little weird moment of introspection aside, he is, you know, he's likely to fight and he does, he is getting ready to dispute the election. There was more this week about yeah. rigged election 2020. Uh, let me read it to you. Yeah. All, all caps. This is, this is yeah. hashtag breaking style stuff. Rig 2020 election. Millions of mail-in ballots will be printed by foreign countries and others. It will be the scandal of our times. Scandal of our times. That is a competitive field. I would it have really, thought. really, really, really is. Well, just, now, to, just question our notice yes. before we go on. What would you say the scandal of our times is? The scandal of our times. Yeah, because there's been a. We talked about it. Diarrhea gate. Yes, <laughs> that tampon frappuccino. I'd yeah. say. Anyway, go on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. Now, there's a couple of things that Trump could be doing here. He's probably doing both. One is he might genuinely be aware that even though there's no evidence to this point that mail-in voting benefits one side or the other, he has kind of sabotaged the Republican mail-in vote. He really has. Uh, and he might be realising, oh, yeah, we actually really need in-person voting, especially because mm. there are all kinds of shenanigans possible with in-person voting Given that the federal court in 2018 ruled that Republicans now are allowed to mount poll watching operations without prior judicial approval, yeah. which they have not been allowed to do since 1982 because yeah. they kept using these poll watching operations to exclude minorities. Yeah. For those of you not familiar with what this looks like, the, the, the last time it's happened on a large scale was the 2004 election where it happened a lot in Ohio. Basically, there are some states, Ohio is one of them, that allows anyone to challenge the eligibility of another voter at the you know force them to yeah. produce their ID force them to cast a provisional ballot now you know in some cases you're going to find someone who can't produce ID and they just can't vote but the real purpose of this is just to increase the length of the lines yeah. right that is state of the art voter suppression it's all about in various ways increasing the length of the lines Federal court has now said, okay, Republicans are allowed to organise these poll-watching operations yeah, again. I just want to fill out a little bit more what you're talking about there, yeah. which is um, the back, back in the 1980 election, what, what Dave's referring to with the 1982 thing came after the 1980 election, Republicans hired a bunch of off-duty police officers and security yes. guards to walk around with these Mickey Mouse uniforms that said uh, National Ballot Security Task Force. Which they're going to do that again, but by the way. They, they are they, recruiting they ex-military yeah. and police officers again. And they'd stand around at poll places with guns visible yeah, and yeah. police radios looking as official as possible, even though they had no actual role whatsoever. This was completely made up yeah. just to scare minorities. because and, and they were just doing it. In in majority minority precincts, yes. essentially, it's a, and the, and just yeah, we've talked about how much minorities like the police, and the and the 
and they were taking advantage of that to scare them. And yeah. they, and so, and as a result of that, um, oh, by the way, you know who, who organized that? Who? Roger Stone. Oh, what everyone's a favorite. Anyway, as a result of that, Democrats threatened to sue them, mm -hmm. and then the Republicans ended up uh, having uh, what they call a consent a consent yeah, decree, yeah. where they basically uh, and it lasted until like like Dr. Dave just said, until just now when John Roberts decided racism was over, and so he got rid of it. Uh, there's also another thing which is added to it as well, which is in 2013 there was a court case Shelby. County versus someone or other. Yes. There's, yeah. Uh, Holder. 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um. Of course. Yeah, Attorney General Dirk. Yes. Is. Anyway, and until then, that was in 2013. Until then, they had this thing called pre-clearance, where if you were in a southern state where you had a history of racism, yes, you need to clear any changes to voting rules whatsoever with the Department of Justice before you did it. Mm. And then that got overruled once again by Justice Roberts in 2013. Yes. Justice Roberts, the friend of the lefties at the moment, <sighs> uh, in 2013. And so as a result of those two decisions, they can now do whatever yes. they like. By the way, I had a fantastic honours student last year, Nina Dillon Britton, who wrote a thesis on Shelby County versus Holder, which won mm. the university medal. And... Uh, She's writing for Onisoir at the moment. So yeah. if you want to get a copy of that, uh, email Onisoir and uh, ask Nina for it. Okay. Um, yeah, but okay, so Trump might be genuinely, you know, trying to suppress male voting because he wants more exposure to these in-person shenanigans. But I think also he's just delegitimizing the result in yeah, advance, I which he seems to have increasing reason to do given what the polls Yeah, I think he's beginning to give up. Are saying. And yeah, he's so he's really seized on... Uh, mail-in voting and in case you're wondering why should mail-in voting take any longer to count there's a couple of reasons one is a lot of states have rules about you cannot start counting yes. mail in until ballots the day until yeah yeah uh, until the polls have closed yeah yeah and by the way two of those states wisconsin and michigan yeah wisconsin in particular watch out for that one on election yes. day yeah so first of all you can't start and second you st they still need to be scanned so it's actually a much more, it's a, it's a longer, much more time-consuming process in most places where you've got electronic scanning to count these mail-in ballots. Of course, for the states that have really widespread use of mail-in ballots, either in in its entirety, like Utah or is Oregon's an entirely mail-in state now, yep, isn't it? Yep, yep, yep. Or just ones that use it a lot, like and, Colorado and California, it's a yep. lot quicker. But most of the states don't have that infrastructure and they're certainly not going to get it before the oh, God, election no. rolls around. So probably unless it's an absolute landslide, like unless that New York Times Siena poll is actually correct about Biden being up by 14 and he stays up by 14, then it is actually quite unlikely that we'll even get a result oh, on I'd, election night. I we're preparing the our election coverage for election day. And I've told ABC over and over again. Yeah. Prepare for election week. It's just not it's just not going to be on the day, unless it's yeah, it's an absolute smashing. I just want to just do, do they suspect that you're just making this up because you just love being on air? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, like I'm a TV guy talking about elections. <laughs> <laughs> it goes with the furniture. TV guys like being on TV, so uh, look, they'll find out, they'll be vindicated. Yeah, um, I wanted to fill out. One more thing you just uh, went past, then by the way, that was very good, but uh, <laughs> one thing you just went past was about uh, Trump self sabotaging. Yes. There's a few, like every every week or two, I'm gonna give you more stats about this. Uh, Florida, <laughs> Florida uh, at the moment, 1.46 million Democrats have signed up to vote by mail, mm. compared to 1.16 million Republicans. That's a 300,000 yeah. vote uh, lead. Uh, in 2016, they were tied. They did exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, this is insane. Not and, not voting by mail. It's yeah. becoming the new not wearing a mask. <laughs> it is. It's, in fact, in Michigan, you're like this. <laughs> yes. Oh, 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 oh. Can you can you tee that up? Hand yeah. of God. It's the Michigan corner. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> this is a this is a very very short Michigan corner. I just have one line to <laughs> say about Michigan. No, I don't have anything to say about mm. Michigan this week. In, but in Michigan. Yes. Trump supporters right now are literally burning letters on the absentee <laughs> ballots. They are burning their absentee ballot invitations. They're not even ballots. They're invitations to get a ballot because <gasps> oh, they're trying to support God. Trump. Yeah. So that's that's not going to work. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I do want to say two two more things. People about this go topic. all in in Michigan. Yeah, they really do. Yeah. Um, first of all, 
I just breezed past Trump's insane tweet without fact-checking it. And we should actually say why it's incorrect, because there might be some poor sap watching this going, oh, no, there's going to be millions of mail-in ballots printed, printed by, by foreign far- countries this and is, others. It's, so in- it's one of those things that's so insane, you just kind of <laughs> yeah. D- yeah, okay. walk Let's, away from th- it. But no. Th- we- this won't take long. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I reckon people would know this if literally millions of ballots have been mailed <laughs> in from overseas. I think people would notice that. Anyway, but let's leave that aside. In order to pull off this scheme, I don't know if he's imagining them sending their fake ballots to the people to fill out or they're imagine- he's imagining them actually filling it out themselves and then sending them in <laughs> for those people. I don't know. But either way... To pull it off, you would need to mimic the ballot's precise size, yes. color, style, weight, font, everything about it. Every county has different ballots. Yeah, yeah. That would be quite an operation yep. to be right across every single day. And they change them yes. constantly. Every election, they change them. So that would be quite an operation to be across all that. And but of course, they don't put them out beforehand, so you don't know what they're going to be like. Yeah. So. They need be. They need need to be the best kind of Nostradamus to pull this off. I know, and of course, like when stuff like this gets put out by Trump or by William Barr, who yeah, was uh, also uh, talking about this, and then so knows better, mindlessly <laughs> repeated by their media allies, mm. and then mindlessly repeated in comments on Facebook. You know the usual mm. cycle mm. throughout the whole process. Yeah, there's just this assumption. Yeah, public servants are idiots. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they they wouldn't be able to tell <laughs> yes. a ballot printed in Myanmar yeah. as opposed to, you know, a, yeah. a, a ballot printed in Macon County. Yeah. Like, no, no they, they, they they can tell. They they can tell. And if and in the case where he's talking about them actually filling out the ballot for you and sending yeah. in this fake ballot, they need to have your signature. And by the way, they need to have your name and address as as putting on putting yeah. your registration record as well. No, so, yeah. It's not going to happen, okay? So don't worry about yeah, that. But in there's, fact, but just, there's a widespread rhetorical thing of just assuming that people are as stupid as you are. Assuming that professionals are mm. as stupid as you are. It's like there was a talking point early on about, oh, all those coronavirus deaths aren't... They're just... Anyone who died while they had coronavirus, yeah, they, yeah. they were just... Yeah. They, they, yeah. they were just... They run over by van. numbers. Yeah. And it's, it's like, no, no. If you thought of that... They thought of that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The problem actually is the direct opposite. Yes. The problem is that they undercount, not overcount. Absolutely. And like, at, 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 if you look at 2016, yes. they, like Dr. Dave just said, these are these are states that were already had already put a lot of thought into this. Had been evolving over decades to get their systems up, and they still didn't count 1% of the mail-in votes in 2016. Shocking. So it's going to be a lot more than 1% not counted Oof. this year. Right? And and whatever fraud you think is taking place is going to be a lot less than 1% or 2 or 3% of the entire electorate, yeah. which is what is going to be undercounted by mail-in votes. That will be the problem. Um, in fact, New York in 2016 had a rate of eight times higher not counting than other states. They really screwed it up. Yeah. Another thing is if you happen to be Native American, you're screwed by mail-in voting because yeah, yep. they don't have normal mailboxes a lot no. of these places. A third of Native Americans, that's a very big number. 1.7 million out of 5.3 million have what the census describes as hard-to-count tracts of land. So they don't have a proper mailbox situation. So. Yeah. That's hard for them as well. It's going to be undercounting. That's going to be the issue. It's going there. to be a major issue. Yeah. So anyway, I'll just throw it. And by the way, there's, there is actually a problem. If Trump actually cared about voter fraud, I'll tell you where he should go. Yes. He should go to Delaware and West Virginia because they've got online voting. Now, unlike, really? yeah, unlike mail voting, oh. online voting, every single person who knows anything about yeah, voting yeah. goes, that is dodgy, that is hackable. Delaware, there by, is no security. by the way, is notoriously like the dodgiest state in the union. So it's mm. some extraordinary percentage mm. of American companies, corporations are actually headquartered in Delaware because the corporate tax is so low. So it's more than 40% of American corporations are headquartered in Delaware. Well, 
So de- depriving other states of, of taxes. Yeah. Uh, another reason a lot of states aren't fond of Delaware, an enormous amount of their revenue comes from the little bit of the highway between New Jersey and Pennsylvania, two much bigger and more significant states. But that, you know, few minutes you've got to drive through Delaware, you're just going to get slugged <laughs> uh, on that. I think I also yeah. remember reading that it was the last state in the Union to abolish flogging. I did not know that. Yeah. There you go. You, you learned something. Delaware. Yeah, it's very, very, very it's impressive It's not just the home of Joe Biden's basement. <laughs> it's the dodgiest state in the union. Well, in this case, they had dodgies all hell as well. Because, by the way, it's not just online. It's online with an app. It is so <laughs> hackable. It is oh, so, so like hackable. Like COVID safe. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, West Virginia is allowing absentee vote voters to use this, this, this app. But yeah. Delaware is allowing everyone, if they are self-isolating due to COVID-19, which will be anyone who says they are, mm. come, the, come the election, they can use the app. Oh, my God. I can imagine so Biden there's your dodgy. trying to use it and not succeeding. I mean, thankfully, both states are safe states. But yes, still, yeah. it's that's your dodgy right yes. there. If you want dodgy, there's your dodgy. Right, anyway, um. Uh, is there anything else? Twenty twenty. Oh yeah, just just this random. There's a QAnon believer. Did you hear about this? No. There's a QAnon believer who's won, who's <laughs> who's the favorite to win a re- Republican nomination in an R plus twenty seven seat. There is going like R plus twenty seven means the Republicans yeah. are ahead by twenty seven points in that seat, which means mm. that in, in her in her primary she won forty one percent of the vote to 20% was yes. second place yeah, and there's yeah, about yeah. to be a runoff. So she's going to win this. Yeah. And she is, and she, her quote from her is many of the things that Q has given clues about and talked on 4chan and other forums have really proven to be true. Wow. There is going to be a Q supporter oh in, in Congress That's next right. year. So just throw that out there. Let's talk about polling, Dr. Dave. Yes. You want to bring up so MIT? The, I mean, we've sort of talked with increasing amazement every mm. week about Biden's growing lead. Well, mm. it has grown further. Mm. Again, so now Real Clear Politics has the average at ten point one, five thirty eight has it at nine point six, mm. and there was this poll at five thirty eight ranked as the highest quality poll, an A plus from yeah. New York Times Siena College that had Biden up by fourteen nationally. Uh, perhaps what's even more alarming for Trump world was some of the things inside that poll, such as showing that Trump was only leading Biden among white voters by one point. I don't think any Democratic presidential candidate since LBJ has won the majority of the white vote. Now, in turn, I'm, so increasingly when I see numbers like this and when I see this lead just continue to expand, I do think more and more about what could be wrong with the overall picture here. Now, there is nothing wrong with the way that that poll was conducted. There absolutely These aren't like the dodgy state polls that mm. we were talking about last week. But just a few things to keep it, some, some healthy scepticism to keep in mind yeah. about this picture. I find it very hard to believe that anyone is going to win by nine points. Um, last candidate to win by more than nine t- points was Ronald Reagan back in 1984 when he won 49 states mm. and ba- the country has just become a lot more partisan since then. I just don't think that's a replicable feat now. I mean, if it is, it's a mo- So I would actually expect those numbers to come down. Yeah. Second thing, in those New York Times, in that New York Times Siena poll, um, 14% were in a category of undecided, don't know wanting to vote for a third party candidate. There aren't going to be that many of mm. of those. And you know, they're going to go to one candidate or another. A lot of them actually a lot of conservative leading ones actually are going to go to Trump. They mm. may be pissed off with Trump at the moment, but you know, they are going to eventually come home to Trump. The other thing is, as we've discussed, still at this point not many polls are putting the likely voter filter on. Yes, that's a big point. And we should still generally expect that a likely voter filter is going to add a few more points for Republicans. For those of you not familiar with this, this is generally, as the election gets closer, pollsters stop just asking anyone who can vote, so registered voters, their opinions, they start to narrow their samples down to people that they believe are likely to vote. 
Uh, by the way, before election year, generally polls are just asked of adults, so they're even mm. less informative. But usually because, uh, you know, in the United States there's a higher propensity to vote among older people, more educated people, wealthier people, these all traditionally tend to be things that favour Republican candidates. But this time... Well, this time, yeah, I mean, Biden is is winning over old people, mm. uh, which is in many ways not that surprising given the context of the pandemic, given Biden's whole thing is basically safety and familiarity. Mm. Um, but if Trump comes back by eight points, Biden won't be winning amongst old people. Probably. No, so, no yeah. he won't. But anyway, so mm. it is important to keep it, that even though we're seeing these quite extraordinary poll numbers, and I mean... Fox News had Biden up by 12 points. So yeah, this isn't yeah. just some sort of no, no, liberal New York Times yeah, conspiracy. Fox News um, had him up by 12%. Yeah. Also had him at 4 a Republican shockingly low levels among whites. Also showed him losing large chunks of the non-college white vote. Um, I think that we may still be in a period where circumstances are maximally unfavourable to Trump while being maximally favourable to Biden. Yeah, this is what I was about to, was about to Biden say. Biden can absolutely do everything on his own mm. terms at the moment. He doesn't need to take any of their bait. He doesn't mm. need to uh, put himself out there publicly. And these two issues could not be better suited for Biden. No. They're both ab- empathy absolutely. issues. When I, when I say these two issues, I on mean race hand, and COVID. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, those issues can get worse as well. So okay. maybe we well, we might not have seen the uh, the biggest lead. In the last week, yeah, you look at COVID in the last week and you go, we haven't even begun yeah. the second spike yet. No, I, I would mm. say any possibility of a quick economic recovery is basically done mm. at this point. I just don't see it happening with the way that the COVID numbers are going now. I did note um, a lot of people for to try and guess at economic yeah. uh, activity, they look at open table bookings, open yeah, yeah. table reservations, because they're, 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 yeah. they're quite representative apparently. And uh, some of the areas in Texas and Florida and places have gone straight down again. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Trump rally was a pretty good measure of this. Mm. Uh, that mm. showed you the level of fear mm. about being in public with mm. a lot of other people. Mm. While that level of fear is out there, it doesn't matter how much you officially reopen things. The economy is not reopening. Yeah. I'll tell you, um, although, yeah, we just shouldn't, we shouldn't write off the idea of, you know, aliens coming down because that's, no. that's very 2020. Yes. <laughs> that's all I'd say. Um, very on brand. I, uh, oh, but there is a, there is a good sign of how much trouble, Trump is in at the moment and he knows he's in trouble. And this is a story I've been trying to work in for weeks. And it, I think you know what it is. What it is. I, I do. Uh, and it's, and it's become newly relevant again because it's a nice little twist. At okay. the end. So, so I'll bring it up. And that is the, the pollster that uh, Dave, Dr. Dave calls John McLaughlin. Yes. It was John McLaughlin. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he's, he's been hired by Donald oh, Trump. Oh, this was so good. I need to tell you who this guy is. Okay. Cause as soon as someone hires John McLaughlin, there's a sign that they're in a lot of trouble yeah. because John McLaughlin has a very well-earned reputation of being a suck up. And he, <laughs> he polls in a way where you're doing really well. Yeah. And so he bucks you up when you're feeling bad. His history is he, he became famous, John McLaughlin amongst uh, wonks, Dr. Dave, <laughs> <laughs> amongst people who were once called wonks uh, when he worked for Eric Cantor. It was a Republican oh, politician. Oh, yes. And, and he convinced Eric Cantor that he was leading. Some of our younger listeners might not even know who Eric Cantor is. You don't is. need to know who he is. But all you need to know is that he was leading his primary challenger by 34 points, according to John McLaughlin. And Cantor lost by 11 points. That's oh, a 45 what a point tragedy error. To a guy called polling. Dave Bratt. <laughs> yes. But Dave yes. Bratt is not of the highest quality. No, no, he's now gone. Like, you shouldn't be losing elections to uh, Dave Bratt. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, th- 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 that was the worst hit, miss, but, but John McLaughlin's had many other misses. He's developed this reputation that you just should not hire John McLaughlin unless you want a yes man. And so no one did hire him for like years and years and years until Trump <laughs> just, Trump just saw 
a few too many polls yeah. <laughs> where he wasn't doing well, and so he hired John McLaughlin. He actually hired him first during the impeachment when he was. Oh yeah, like, I remember like, this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and John McLaughlin did did push polling for him. I, I want to read you just to give you a flavour of John McLaughlin. I want to read you one of his polling questions from the impeachment era. Okay, is just this just trying to suss out the electorate. <laughs> Historic precedent has always been that to begin an impeachment inquiry, the House of Representatives has always held a vote. Nancy Pelosi and Democrats are now breaking with precedent to conduct a purely partisan impeachment. In your opinion, do you think that unless Speaker Pelosi and Democrats <laughs> hold a vote, the president's right not to cooperate with this inquiry? Well, that's not, that's not biased at all. That's like one <laughs> level above the kinds of polls you see on Donald Trump's website. Like, who do you want as president? <laughs> Donald Trump yeah. or this guy from MS-13 yeah. who is a Democrat? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I should say the best thing about that question was he misspelt representatives oh, in House of Representatives. Classic McLolan. Uh, classic McLolan. Anyway, yeah. uh, anyway, so anyway, so, he, so Trump hired Mc, McLolan to to analyze the polling about two yes. weeks ago, three weeks ago, because when it when it first turned against him. Yes. And uh and McLolan came out with this whole spiel which Trump released. He tweeted it out. Yes. And I want to just just briefly go through some of the some of the points he made. He, he talked about some really interesting points. Yeah, they're great points. Yes. He talked about how how Republicans were undersampled compared to the 2016 election. Oh. It didn't occur to him that it might possibly be fewer Republicans there, at the moment yes. when Donald Trump is unpopular. Didn't didn't think of that. Also, it's a very well known fact of polling that when people are on the nose, yes, they they're supposed to become demoralized. They yes. don't answer polls. They don't vote no. either. Yeah, yeah. So if that demoralization persists, yes. there aren't going to be many Republicans yes. turning up. That's yeah. the first thing. And given that, you know, we've just seen or we saw a week ago Trump emerging from his helicopter with his tie undone. Yes. Hat <sighs> in his hand, looking like someone had just told him you're never coming back to Friday night drinks again <laughs> and we, we'll see you at HR on Monday. And also. That, that was a picture of dejection. It really was. And for the first time ever that I can remember, yeah. Donald Trump showed <laughs> his foundation. It was on the inside of his collar. Oh, We've never seen that before. That. He's he's so careful about yeah. that. Yeah. And he was just like, ah, oh, fuck this. <laughs> it's fucking all. I'm just going to go into my room and listen yeah. to Blink 182. Yeah. He, he was not happy. <laughs> anyway, more John McLaughlin. Uh, don't, don't chin up, John. Chin up, Trump. John McLaughlin's got some good points to make. He 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 took he took the registered point you made, the yep. likely vote. But the point he made was therefore you you must be able to disregard uh, uh, Biden plus twelve polls <laughs> because because they were registered voters. Now the point the point that about likely voters registered voters is a good point. It's a good point for. Two points, as in yes. as in for two percentage points. Yes. Not for 12 no, percentage points. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, and you also pointed out that the, that those polls that they were referring to came up before the employment numbers. So that would have changed everything. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That really worked out, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> in hindsight. Anyway, he also noted, wait for it, the N NBC, ABC and CNN, which were the three yeah. polling companies, they have Democrat operatives on the air, like Chuck oh, Todd and George Stephanopoulos. Well... So therefore their polling operations must be wrong. Yes. He concluded when you add up all those points I just said, and yes. only those points, <laughs> that it must be an intentional attempt to suppress your vote. Must be. And there's no other explanation. Must be. And in then, May. Of course I yeah. suppress the vote in May. And then Trump picks <laughs> this up and runs with it and yes. says, this is what's known as a voter suppression yes. poll. Um, but my favourite bit of this is yes, then the campaign demands that CNN retract the poll and apologise. They threaten the lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> One of the campaign clowns goes on CNN yes. and they, CNN tears him in you asshole. Yeah. And then the Trump campaign demands an apology for that interview. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, I guess, I, I, we, yeah. My, my favourite bit of this of this letter, I mean, yes. that, that that is a good bit you, you cite. Yeah. But my favourite <laughs> of this letter is the way it ends. It ends with the sentence. It says... It says but this is what happened in 2016. This did not happen in 2016, guys. Trump was never behind by 14 no, points wasn't. in 2016. No. Never even close. Anyway, this is what happened in 2016. Let Quote, 
let's prove them wrong again. That's your neutral polling expert yeah. saying, let's prove let's them wrong prove them again. Let's prove them wrong again, my God. Now, the relevance to this week, remember I said there's a, there's yeah. a juicy oh, little oh, twist? Oh, yes. Yeah. What is it? Trump's down by eight points in McLaughlin polling. Oh! Even with McLaughlin. Oh, it's two McLaughlin. That is brutal. <laughs> there you go. Oh, dear. There you go. Uh, you, know what, you know what's time for, Dr. Dave? Stats Nugget. <laughs> That nugget. You What's guessed that, it. that nugget? The Democracy Index 2019 is out, Dr. Dave. Oh. This is, uh, this is, this is assessing the, 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 the healthiness or otherwise of a, of a country's democracy. America is now ranked the world's 25, 25th best democracy with a score of 7.96. Incidentally, to... that's almost exactly where they are in COVID testing per capita. Yeah. 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 That, that's a good call. Um, anything below eight is considered a flawed democracy. America is now officially a flawed democracy. Yeah, well, according to the Democracy I, Index 2019. I think, it, I mean, as uh, one of my mentors at University of Michigan, Rob Mickey, who I've talked about before on this show, pointed out the United States did not even become a full democracy until 1972. Yeah. And that leads me into a promised. History lesson. This is where I'm going. Let me finish this and then you can yes. just just note for those who are interested in the democracy index, Australia is number nine. Mm -hmm. uh, top The top ones are Norway, Iceland, Sweden, yeah, of New Zealand, course. of course. Oh, those smug scandies. But I just want to cite a couple of the countries above America. Yep. Mauritius, number 18. Ooh. Costa Rica, number 19. Oh, no, Costa Rica is a, is a famously stable well, democratic you country. There's your evidence. And Chile at 21. Yeah. No, Costa Rica is well consistently the strongest performer in Central America. Okay. Take it away, Dave. So yep. I have been asked to talk about how the Republican Party got to where it is because a few weeks ago we talked about the Democratic Party. So the Republican Party, it began in anti-slavery. Um, two parties beforehand had collapsed, the Whigs and the Know-Nothings, because they couldn't come to a consistent position on slavery when it was the main moral issue in the country. So there was mass demand for a consistently anti-slavery party. That was the Republican Party. The overwhelming sort of ideology was basically evangelical Protestantism. Now, you might be going, whoa, evangelical Protestantism, that's really right-wing and racist. Well, there was a version of that in the South. The, you know, the Confederates were also motivated by evangelical Protestantism. They read into it that uh, slavery was justified by the Bible. You know who else were evangelical Protestants at the, at the time? Their slaves, mm. who had a very different reading of the Bible <laughs> uh, and were obviously, you know, because they weren't allowed into the same churches as white people. Yeah, mm. they, they were de developing some quite different takes on mm. evangelism. So you had basically these three types of evangelical Protestantism. Uh, Republican Party was this crusading cultural uh, evangelical Protestantism that, among other things, wanted immigrants to Americanize, damn it, and stop drinking on Sundays and stop using their own languages in their church services and, and things like that. So it wasn't all, uh, you know, peace, love and tolerance. In mm. fact, there was very little peace, love and tolerance <laughs> going on. But they did yeah. believe that slavery was completely immoral, that slaveholders were completely immoral and that they had to be absolutely wiped out. So civil war was, you know, it, it was two sides who believed that God was on their side. And if you look at the lyrics of Battle Hymn of the Republic, you know, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the mighty lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth goes marching on. Glory, glory to South Sydney. Um, <laughs> that one was for the hand of God. Uh, you can get you get a, a, a sense of the flavour of this was an apocalyptic battle over the most basic moral principles. The Republican Party was founded to fight this battle in Jackson, Michigan, in 1854. Uh, a, a part of their manifesto, though, which is often overlooked these days, which was very interesting, was they said we want to abolish the twin relics of barbarism, slavery, and polygamy. 
Oh. They really hated polygamy. Well, they succeeded in that, didn't they? Uh, they did. The <laughs> Republican Party crushed the life out yeah. of the Mormon church yeah. over the next 50 years. Yeah. I write about this in my book, Religious Persecution and Political Order in the United States. Uh, yeah, Republicans hated the Mormons, absolutely hated Mormon mm. uh, Mormon polygamy. They also, still do, Mitt Romney. Also... <laughs> The Mormons, who are basically running their own autonomous chaz out in the out in the West. Now I'm interested. Uh, <laughs> were uh, they were they stopped Republican Party consolidation of uh, control of the West. But anyway, so we get through the Civil War. Then, as I mentioned earlier in the show, Republicans are basically in charge for about the next fifty years or so, and their ideology starts to change. Um, another one of my mentors at Michigan, Pam Brandwine, once scolded me for projecting the ideology of the 1860s Republican Party onto the ideology of the 1890s Republican Party. Yeah, you should have known better. I really should have known better. What <laughs> happened over those 30 years, the Republican Party got very into industry, manufacturing, commerce, and the development of major cities, banks. They really started to um, fulfil Alexander Hamilton's vision, essentially. Mm. Big banks, big railroad, big industry. One of the ways they funded this was through this major, major tariff, which effectively had uh, penalised the South, punished the South for decades after the Civil War, um, while protecting Northern industry and also providing a pension for Union soldiers. So the Republican Party moved from this party that, you know, their single issue was slavery, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, by the end of Reconstruction, Republicans had pretty much given up on African-American empowerment as a cause, and they kind of got progressively more racist. Now, from the 1860s to the 1890s, you would have found most liberals and most radicals in the Republican Party. So a lot of early feminists are in the, uh, in the Republican Party, people that you would generally sort of consider on the left of politics. But in the 1890s, the, uh, the People's Party emerges, which is a left populist party. And in the early 20th century, the progressive movement occurs, which cuts across parties. So mm -hmm. Theodore Roosevelt, who's a Republican, is a progressive. William Jennings Bryan, who's a Democrat, is also, um, is also a progressive. Um, but the point being, the Republican Party ceases to, uh, it, it becomes a far more business-oriented uh, party. And also the Democratic Party is getting pretty conservative by this point as well, when all the progressive energy is in the People's Party. And the progressive movement sort of peaks in the first decade or so of the 20th century, mm. then it peters out. World War One has a lot to do with that. But anyway, by the 20s, both major parties are basically really conservative, although back in those days it would have been referred to as liberalism, referring mm. to essentially free markets. The only real difference between the two parties is that the Democrats were a lot more amenable to uh, maintaining the traditional cultures of immigrants. So this is they nominate Al Smith, uh, who's a Catholic, um, first Catholic ever to get the nomination for a major party in 1928. The Ku Klux Klan is so pissed off in, in West Virginia. Well, Democrats are so pissed off in West mm. Virginia that they nominate a Klansman against him. Mm. Um, so 1928 actually is a pivotal election as far as the realignment of the black vote. Prior to that, African-Americans had overwhelmingly voted Republican. That was the party of black liberation. But the Republican Party, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, is getting so racist during this period that they actually start to believe they can peel off votes in the South by being racist and tarring the Democratic Party as basically the party of immigrants and African-Americans because a lot of African-Americans are also beginning to take an interest in the Democratic Party in the North uh, because, you know, that's where the unions are. There's Even though the Democratic Party is really pretty conservative, if there's going to be any... Uh, sort of left-wing energy there, it's probably going to come from the Democratic Party. So 1928 is often regarded as the first election where I think Hoover's still got the majority of African-American votes, but this is when a shift towards the Democratic Party begins um, among African-Americans. Now, Republicans, you know, they there is a racially liberal component in the Republican Party that stays pretty powerful for quite a long time. So in 1948, uh, Thomas Dewey, 
who's the uh, is, is, is the Republican candidate is a racial liberal. By the time that you have things like the Civil Rights Act in 1964, there's this whole there's still this whole raft of liberal Republicans whose votes are absolutely crucial uh, to getting it through. Um, you also have who was that very liberal Republican mayor of New York during that time? Don't John know. Lindsay, I think it was. Um, so there are these seriously uh, liberal Republican figures. Now, um, but there is an increasing conservatism within the party and the 1964 party convention just basically explodes in right-wing anger that gets Barry Goldwater the nomination. Now, Barry Goldwater always insisted that he was not personally a segregationist. And I think he was involved with the Arizona NAACP. He desegregated the Arizona National Guard, but he was very big on states' rights. Mm. Okay, And states' rights, when, when you talked states' rights in the 1960s, all you meant was the rights of states to segregate. Now, this wasn't a terribly effective electoral strategy, Goldwater only won, I think, five states in that election. One was Arizona and then it was four deep south states. I think it was Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, But this shows Republicans that there are conservative white votes for them in the south. And I can't remember who it was who said, let's hunt where the ducks are. But by the time Nixon rolls around in 1968, this is a full-blown election strategy that becomes known as the Southern Strategy. In truth, what's often referred to as the Southern Strategy, which, by the way, if you're wondering why Trump keeps going on about law and order, it's because this was one of the major slogans from this period. It was the classic white conservative, use the spectre of black unrest to scare the shit out of white moderates. Um, it wasn't just the former Confederacy. It was the new suburban air, new suburban tracts in California and Arizona. It was the whole Sun Belt. It was also northern urban ethnic whites who felt that they were the ones who were taking the brunt of desegregation efforts uh, in in their neighbourhood. So Nixon picks up votes from all over the place. Uh, that coalition <laughs> got to go in a couple of minutes. That coalition <laughs> is then successfully also reconstructed by. Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, except Ronald Reagan is far more genuinely right wing. Mm. Uh, Ronald Reagan is, I mean, it might have been his experiences as California government that really made him right wing, but I think he was pretty right wing uh, to begin with. And he is the one who really brings on board the religious coalition. So it's Ronald Reagan forms this very powerful coalition between conservative Protestants and conservative Catholics who had previously really... Uh, distrusted each other. He forges the the Christian right, um, essentially. And that is the brief story of how the Republicans became what they are now. Thank you very much, Dr. Dave. My now, pleasure. we uh, unfortunately don't have a, uh, a sound cart to introduce the next segment, but it's becoming a very regular segment. It's the segment where Dr. Dave leaves and I talk about Michael Flynn. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so Dr. Enjoy Dave, the, Flynn Friday. You'll say, so say uh, bye bye to the peps, Dr. Dave, and uh, See you guys. See and hand of God, do you want to please uh, take the seat? And uh, hand of God just sits in your seat. Oh, and, that's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I enjoy it. <laughs> okay, now as as the hand of God uh, takes the position, um, <laughs> the now where we left Michael Flynn was uh, he had uh, he was uh, the national security advisor for Donald Trump for about two seconds before he was sacked uh, back in 2017. Um, he was sacked for because Donald Trump uh, was was told that he had lied under under oath while well, not, not even under oath he was, he was just lying to the FBI when the FBI were asking him about some phone calls that he made with Kislyak, the Russian ambassador at the end of 2016. This was after the election. And uh, so he was the incoming national security advisor. He, he spoke to Kislyak about a few things in particular about uh, sanctions that Obama had just passed because of Russian interference in the election. 
And uh, then the FBI asked him about that and he denied that he spoke about uh, sanctions to the FBI. The FBI had heard the transcripts of the phone calls and so they knew he was lying. And uh, then that got leaked out. This is, there's a lot of dodgy things happening around now, not just from Flynn, but also from the FBI. The FBI didn't tell him he was that they basically lulled into a false sense of security when they interviewed him. They didn't tell him that he could be prosecuted for lying and this was a serious interview. They didn't go through proper protocols. They they never would have even spoken to him if they went through proper pro protocols, but they they basically took advantage of the fact that the Trump administration at that point in time was a bit of a mess to try and flout all kinds of protocols and regulations just to get to Flynn. They then basically entrapped him into lying uh, he still had to lie. Mm. <laughs> they, 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 they didn't get inside his head. He had to lie. I mean, he did lie. And then he was charged for it uh, under Muller. He then pled guilty. And then he got a new lawyer who said, this whole thing stinks. Mm. Take back that plea and let's find out what's going on. And they got a whole bunch of information out from Bill Barr, who was only too keen to give them information. <laughs> and then... Uh, and, then, and just now the Department of Justice uh, asked the judge who had presided over this case to, that the, to let the charges go. He said, we want, to, we want to dismiss the charges. Even though he's pled guilty, we want to dismiss the charges. Uh, and I've missed out all kinds of stuff. But that's basically the background leading up to where we're at. Then what happened was, this was so unusual that a, the Department of Justice would ask to drop charges after the guy had pled guilty, mm. that's basically never happened. And Judge Sullivan, who was a Clinton appointee, I believe, uh, he didn't like it very much. He felt like he'd uh, been taken for a bit of a ride and he was deeply suspicious about what was going on with Bill Barr and the fact that all the prosecutors had resigned rather than signing on to that motion. And uh, so anyway, so then he said, you know what? I might not, I might not allow you to dismiss those charges. I might just keep on going on with this case. Thank you very much. You don't want to prosecute it. It's part of justice with the prosecutors. You want to prosecute it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a, for an amicus curiae, a friend of the court to come in a, like a, 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 a respected judge or legal practitioner to come in and present the case on your behalf about why I shouldn't allow these charges to be dismissed. Mm. I might dismiss them, but I just want to hear someone argue the opposite line. That's what he said. And, and Flynn's lawyer said, what the hell is going on here? The P department of justice doesn't want to prosecute. It's their job to decide whether to prosecute. You might not like it. You might think they're corrupt. You can think whatever you like. It's not your job. You're the judge. You're not the prosecutor. The prosecutor says, we don't want to prosecute, let him go. And so they then appealed to the court of appeals mm. to ask for what they call a mandamus order. A mandamus order basically orders the judge to let, to, to do something in this case, to allow the charges to be dismissed. Okay. So they, he then presents his case to the appeals court. The appeals court just handed down their verdict this week. This is what I'm going to tell you about just briefly now. Briefly, five minutes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now the issue here is, did Sullivan have to grant, uh, did, did, did Sullivan have the, did, did he have to grant leave to the, to the, grant the leave of the court for the government to dismiss the case? Or could the government just dismiss the case whether he granted leave or not? Because there is a rule in the, in criminal procedure, for, it's called 48A, rule 48A, which says that the court decides whether to grant leave or not. Okay. If the court does get the check, gets the, has the opportunity to grant leave for the government to dismiss a criminal case, then you need to allow them to have a hearing to decide whether they grant leave. If it's just an automatic thing that happens, then they might not have no, they might not have the right to have that hearing. This is what the court was deciding. The appeals court, that is. Now, the appeals court, it wasn't the full appeals court. It was just three people on the appeals court. They have a much bigger bench, but it was just three people. Out of that, 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 those three people, one of them was a, 
I think it was appointed by Clinton. I think might be Obama. That it was, it was appointed by Obama. One was appointed by Obama. One was appointed by Reagan. This uh, Judge Henderson, and she was she's a very conservative judge, Judge Henderson. But then there's this woman called Naomi Rao, who is appointed by Trump, and is generally considered to be the biggest hack out of the judiciary. Like a lot of people really don't have much respect for Naomi Rao, and so people weren't quite sure how this would go. They handed down their judgment yesterday or two days ago, two one for Flynn. Mm. And I want to go through their reasoning briefly. They said that, uh, now bear in mind appeals courts, they're not supposed to grant mandamus for this kind of stuff. Mandamus is only supposed to be granted if the person seeking that relief has no other adequate means to attain the relief they desire. If there's any other way, they, that shouldn't happen because Mandamus is coming over the top of a judge and mm. saying, you can't even hear the case. That's a pretty big deal. So they're not supposed to do that unless there's no other options. Uh, and, and yeah, and that they've, they've got, and it's got to be clear and indisputable that there are no other options. Okay. Now, no one thinks that Michael Flynn has no other options because here's an option. Sullivan can find, can find that they, can't dismiss the, that they won't dismiss the charges and then Flynn can appeal. There's an option. He can just appeal. They can wait till Sullivan issues his ruling and then Flynn can appeal it yeah. to the same appeals court. They don't need to stop Sullivan ruling. They can appeal after the ruling. That doesn't hurt Flynn at all. Mm. Waste a couple of months, but that's not a big deal, right? The court said, we don't care that Flynn has that obvious other option. We don't think it hurts Flynn. We think it hurts the government because the reason why it hurts the government is if they conduct this hearing, then, uh, then the, uh, the uh, I've got a quote here. Judge Sullivan has demonstrated an intent to scrutinize the reasoning and motives of the department of justice, which, and that would be, be, they would create an irreparable harm that cannot be remedied on appeal. They're saying that Flynn, his situation, he's fine. He can appeal. Mm. But if the, with the Department of Justice, if, if Sullivan scrutinizes what went on with Bill Barr, that could create a harm that, it's, that, that is then too late. You can't take it back once he's scrutinized Bill Barr. Mm. So appealing doesn't fix that. So they, say, they, they said, therefore... Therefore, they should not, they should not allow him to grant, to, to have a choice of granting leave. He, he just absolutely has to grant leave and dismiss those charges because they can't risk that danger to the Department of Justice. Now, here's the problem with that. If you're following this, you following it so far, Dr. Dave? No, 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 Dr. Dave, hand of God. <laughs> yeah, okay. You're, you're very polite. Um, <laughs> the problem is this. It wasn't Department of Justice that applied for the mandamus order. It was Michael Flynn. It's Michael Flynn that, or that, 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 that is the one who's been charged. Michael Flynn is the one who, who appealed. And they're saying, okay, Michael Flynn, you're okay. You don't need to worry. But this will hurt the Department of Justice, mm. who weren't the ones who were applying. Yeah. So it is irrelevant whether it's... So that's completely specious reasoning. That's just ridiculous, right? So that's the first, that's the first reason. By the way, I'm actually on Flynn's side in all this. I've said this before. I think the FBI were terrible to Michael Flynn. And so I actually don't think they should have charged him. And I was in favor of dismissing the charges. Mm. But this reasoning yeah, is crazy. bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, and the next thing they said, which was also bullshit, was they, Nami Rao, the hack judge, she said, on the record before the district court, this is Sullivan's court, yeah. there is no clear evidence contrary to the government's representations. This is the reasoning she gave. Mm. She's saying that you can't have a hearing. There's no reason for you to have a hearing. There's no evidence that supports anything to contradict the government. So how can you have a hearing? Are you seeing the contradiction here? You may not be. <laughs> the contradiction is... How the hell can they have evidence when they haven't had the hearing exactly, yet? Yeah. You're saying you can't have a hearing to find evidence mm. because you have no evidence. 
That's what she's saying, which yeah. is just crap. And the last time I heard this kind of crap was during the impeachment mm. when the senators were saying, were saying we must dismiss these charges without hearing from witnesses because they didn't have enough evidence to mm. hear from witnesses. You go, <laughs> ah! It's complete <laughs> circular. It's completely bad faith and they know it. Yeah. Naomi Rao absolutely knows. It. She's a smart person. That's bullshit. Mm. Anyway, turns out, not turns out, it's just a fact that there were two to one Republican judges to Democrat judges on yeah. there. The entire panel of the appeals court is actually seven to four Democrats. So if Sullivan appeals to the entire bench of mm. the appeals court, he's probably going to win anyway. But it's just, especially when we've seen the Supreme Court be as unpredictable as they have been recently, it's just depressing mm. how bad that judgment was. That was hack shit. Yeah. And that is depressing. So I just want to just raise, for those who actually care at the Michael Flynn thing, I just want to just raise what was going on there. One more thing about the Michael Flynn thing. Uh, one, they, they've been leaking out explosive, in inverted commas, evidence every couple of days saying, oh, here's something else we found. Bill Barr's been, here's another thing, here's yeah. another thing, here's another thing. They did this this recent one, recent one, and I just want to share this with you. These are explosive notes. Is it hashtag breaking? This is hashtag breaking. Yeah. This is hashtag let's get after it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a Chris Cuomo reference for those who know what, don't know what I'm talking about. Um, these are explosive notes. Uh, this is from the news article. They described as explosive notes. From Peter Strzok, who's the FBI yeah, agent, Strzok. who was... Writing, essentially, he was right. This is a bit of Chinese whispers here. He was writing notes about what Jim Comey told him about the meeting that Jim Comey had on mm. January 5 with Joe Biden and Barack Obama and Susan Rice and a bunch of security people from the Obama administration. Mm. So this is, this is while Obama's still president before Trump's come in. This is just after Flynn's phone calls with Russia. Um, they were, and they were talking about it. And there's been a lot of attempts by Republicans to try and tie Obama through this meeting to the attempt to, to persecute Michael Flynn. Yeah. Okay. I don't even know who some of these people are. I'm just going to read these notes, these explosive notes. Get ready for the explosion. <laughs> okay. I hope you're wearing some, yeah. some, some fireproof undies there. <laughs> hand of God. NSADDAG, whoever that is, says Flynn cuts other countries. Don't know what that means. The director of the DAG says, lean forward on unclass. Okay. These are, these are the explosive it's, it's notes. Explosive. Yeah, explosive. Yeah, yeah. VP, this is Biden, mm -hmm. says Logan Act. Ooh. Logan Act, for those who don't know, is something I go on about yeah. endlessly, <laughs> is about the, you're not supposed to, it's a bullshit law that says you're not supposed to uh, contradict uh, the government's foreign policy uh, when you're not a member of the government. And that, and the suggestion there is that Michael Flynn um, broke the Logan Act by contradicting Obama's foreign policy with Kislyak uh, before he'd become the NSA. He was about to be the NSA in like weeks. So that's a real bullshit charge. But they're attributing that to Biden, mm. saying Logan Act. President, these are unusual times. Oh, man, it's explosive. Vice President. I've been on the Intel committee for 10 years and I never, I presume he said, I've never seen something like this. I don't know. President, make sure you look at things and have the right people on it. Oh, whoa. President, is there anything I shouldn't be telling transition team? So he's talking about, uh, because of this Michael Flynn stuff, is should I not be talking to Trump and his people about what's going on? Mm. Uh, D, I think is Comey, director of the FBI. Flynn... Kislyak calls, but appear legit. So I think he's saying there, don't tell them about the Flynn Kislyak calls, but they do seem legit, which is interesting. That is actually interesting mm. that Comey is saying, even then the calls seemed okay. And then they asked him about those calls three weeks later to, and then they trapped him for perjury. Illegible. Happy new year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh man. That is explosive those are the explosive yeah, revelations I don't know how your okay? laptop's still together <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's just a shred of <laughs> shred of silicon just smeared over this panel okay so to, so yes Biden said Biden apparently talked about the Logan Act and he did at another time on 
May 14th, he, he, he said, quote, I was never a part or had any knowledge of any criminal investigation to Flynn while I was in office, period. Not one single time. So they're saying, oh, there's a contradiction there. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know because this is Chinese whispers. This is some yeah. person talking, writing down what some other person said, which was massively hearsay. So ambiguous what the hell is going on there. I did my best to interpret it, but we don't know. Like, it, it's hardly evidence. And also, yeah, Biden talked a lot of shit, let's face it. Like, so, <laughs> so who knows what the hell he was He probably doesn't even remember what he said in that meeting as soon as he walked out of that meeting. But anyway. Um, but the, face pony soldier. Something like that. Something like, yeah. that, something like that. But look, look, look the, the fact is, that may be something. There, there may be an angle there, a Biden angle, maybe. Um, I'm not seeing how this is an amazing yeah. get for Flynn. <laughs> like, just, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, yes, it's interesting that Comey, Comey said that the calls appeared to legit. They could still interview them about them and, and he's the one who chose to lie. Um, and then this doesn't, Barack Obama saying these are unusual times and make sure you look at things and have the right <laughs> people on it. There's no smoking gun for yeah, anything. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they, they apparently are. Um, so anyway, so, but that is what. That is what the people at the Federalists are just foaming at the mouth about. They, they're, they're loving that. So anyway, that is what's going on with Michael Flynn. The fact is there's this dodgy ruling, which is which is allowing him to get off. Mm. I think he should get off anyway, but not because of that ruling. They're then going to appeal that. I think he's almost certainly going to lose that appeal. Yeah. Uh, and I still think he should get off, but I would like, <laughs> I would like it to happen by a proper process. That would be nice. Uh, I am going to leave you guys. That's enough for this. Thank you very much, Hand of God. I'm going to leave you guys. Hand of God is going to run around and he's going to play the final clip. I just want to, this is the kind of thing which, yeah, I like to watch hearings, right? And there was an interesting hearing uh, this week uh, about um, testimony about people uh, who aren't very, don't like Bill Barr very much. There was this guy, Donald Ayer, who was, um, he was a predecessor of, of Bill Barr when he was a conservative Republican, actually he worked for George H W Bush and he was uh, Bill Barr's predecessor. And he, he didn't like uh, Bill Barr very much and he was trashing him to the Congress. But the thing was, he went a bit long. He went a little bit over time and Louis Goma, who is a real Goma, uh, he, um, he, uh, he decided to protest the fact this guy went over time by just trying to make a nuisance of himself. And I want to play it to you just to see how frustrating because exactly how frustrating it is to try to watch congressional hearings because man, they do shit like this all the time and you just want to throttle them. Here's a little flavor of what I put up with all the time to try and come up with information for you guys. Enjoy. See you later, Peppers. Thank you very much. And uh, a hi to YouTube as well. Must see you guys again. See you next week. Bye-bye. In closing, it needs to be said that Bill Barr does regularly lie in ways that impact official action. Along with his continuing media project to make Americans believe that the FBI conspired against Donald Trump, his statements about the Mueller report, Jeffrey Berman's supposed resignation, and Barr's own role in the events in Lafayette Park come quickly to mind. So does his practice of regularly shrouding himself in the rhetoric and trappings of the rule of law even as he desecrates and undermines the institutions that make it possible. But to me, Barr's crowning dishonesty Gentlemen's is the portrait of Edward Levy that a recent New York Times article showed hanging on the wall of his conference room as though the current incumbent regular, had regular anything. Order, regular order, the witness will conclude. Regular order is right. We're way beyond regular order. The witness will continue. Can I have one more sentence here? By all means. Okay. But to me, Barr's crowning dishonesty is the portrait of Edward Levy that a Mr. recent... Mr. Chairman, I would New York ask Times that, they, uh, that the sergeant at arms witness be conclude. called upon to stop the disruption of this meeting. I can't hear this witness. This is a very important witness. Yeah, witness well, he's way time. beyond and the chair time. has And if the there are no rules about the when people has can the authority, talk, does there's no not. rules about when you can make noise. The gentleman makes the... A good chair. point, and the chair will enforce the five-minute rule. Witness will proceed. The chair will is not enforcing the we'll five-minute rule. The witness will conclude. You, Mr. You want, chairman, this is outrageous. Conclude. Do you have no respect for the rules whatsoever? The witness will conclude. He's too.
two minutes beyond concluding, and you don't let us have that kind of time. You gabble down immediately. You're being grossly unfair. This man had a written we'll statement, and he knew to cut it to five minutes. He couldn't do it. Either we have rules or we don't. The gentleman will suspend. The witness will conclude. Thank you. Well, then in we closing, can keep making it needs noise. to be said that Bill Barr does regularly lie in ways that, that impact official action. Mr. Chairman, there is not order.